was not entirely correct. Technically, it is Sunday. But how did you like that parcel tongue? Did I have you convinced? Yeah? No? Okay. Anyway, I only have one note for my fellow vloggers today, and that is for Amanda. I just wanted to let you know that if you were ever in a similar situation to Harry, I would assist you with your gross rubber yarn, and I hope that you would do the same for me, although I suspect that you would not. My favorite line from this section comes in about a half a page describing Fred and George's actions toward Harry in chapter 12. And here they're kind of just pretending to go along with the idea that Harry is the heir of Slytherin and, and entertaining the rumors but making fun of them at the same time. It's a sentence describing Ginny's reactions to her brother's behavior, but it shows more about Fred and George's actions. And it's, oh don't, Ginny whined every time Fred asked Harry loudly who he was planning to attack next, or when George pretended to ward off Harry with a large clove of garlic when they met. I love this line just because it shows how loyal Fred and George are to Harry. And, and I know I've said this before, I really like characters who are very loyal to Harry, and that's definitely the twins. Even in a situation like this where all the evidence is against him, they, you know, they back him up just like Fred and Hermione. And, and there are times in the series, I think, where, where Fred and George are on Harry's side that maybe other people who should be closer to him aren't. Um, and for that, I love Fred and George. This is just one of those examples. Also, I love the George warding off Harry with a large clove of garlic when they met because that implies that George is walking around with a large clove of garlic, which I think is unusual for a boarding school student. He, he would have had to have planned that ahead of time and gone down to the kitchens and gotten a clove of garlic from the kitchens and walked around with it until he saw Harry. Um, I appreciate that forethought. Thank you, George. And finally, my assignment as given to me this week by Nathaniel was to talk about parcel tongue, the history of parcel tongue, where that came from. So I'm going to start with the word itself. Parcel tongue, parcel mouth, actually, um, is a word, according to J.K. Rowling, that means a person with a problem with their mouth, such as a hair lip. So something, something physical that's, that's not normal about a person's mouth, they would be called a parcel mouth. And she says it's an old, old word, not one that is used anymore, but, uh, but something they used to call people. I had always assumed that parcel mouth, maybe the first half of that parcel, meant snake. Um, perhaps in Latin. I, I don't know why. I just assumed and I hadn't really given it much thought. But Of course, snake in Latin is serpens or serpentis, obviously. I don't know why I didn't think of that. I had a hard time finding any folklore about snake language or animal language in general. Obviously, every single culture in the world has stories about humans communicating with animals. But generally, it exists in kind of a different time when there just wasn't a language barrier, when humans and animals were able to communicate freely with one another without any any issues. Obviously, the most notable historical account of humans and, and animals communicating with one another is the one that Carol mentioned. It's definitely the most relevant to this story, and that would be uh, the tale of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, um, because it is a snake and, and they are communicating. The only other tale that I could find involving snakes and an uh, animal language came from Europe and from Eastern Europe, and it's a terrible tale and I am not telling it. Um, but it involves a king of snakes bestowing uh, the animal language upon a shepherd. But it's, it's animal language, it's not specifically snake language, it just happens to be the king of the snakes that, that gives it to the guy. Other than that, I think that the idea that snakes have a language specifically for snakes that some humans are capable of understanding, I think that's a largely original concept on the part of J.K. Rowling. Um, of course, it's entirely possible that I miss some. And if so, and if you know of any, feel free to leave your video responses or comments, but, uh, but I think this one's mostly on J.K. Rowling. If we're speaking of modern times, of course, people do all kinds of studies on, on the ways that animals communicate with one another, and especially the auditory ways that, that they communicate with one another. Um, dog studies and dolphin studies and um, chimpanzees and gorillas and elephants and birds, and <laughs> there are lots of different ones and lots of different ways to study them. Obviously understanding the different meanings behind different sounds that they make is a far cry from actually communicating with them, making the sounds ourselves, and speaking a language. Now, in the past, chimpanzees have been taught sign language to the point where a human and a, and a chimpanzee can have a kind of conversation using that sign language, but of course that's not understanding their language, that's just teaching them one of our languages. And that's kind of all I have for this week. Um, we will see you next week when the group takes on chapters 13 through 15, and uh, other than that, 